Hey everybody, uh, we're going to do a Sunday school lesson and uh, this, is, this is actually Sunday morning when I'm recording this, so uh, hope y'all been in prayer uh, again. Uh, sticking to the book of Romans, I can't get away from it. Uh, I hope you guys are encouraged by it as, as much as I am and just stand in awe, just stand in awe constantly of what the Lord is trying to teach us because it's, it's continual learning, it's continual growth. In, uh, in his majesty and in his holiness and, and in the knowledge of him. That's what the Bible teaches us. And it's, it's knowing him. And that's what we're going to get into uh, again today. We're going to back up just a little bit. We were in Romans chapter 5 last time. We're going to back up uh, again to Romans chapter 3. And it's almost as if just need to, to pitch a tent and fix something to eat and sit right here for a while. Because the, the Romans chapter 3 is just absolutely amazing. When you start digging into all the aspects of it and, and, the, and the different things that the Lord's trying to teach us just in this one chapter, it, it just, it, to me, it just, like I said, I'm just a kid in the candy store still. I'm just learning this stuff. And uh, you guys have probably forgot more than, than, even, than I'll ever know. And uh, again, that's just another thing that amazes me trying to teach people that know more than I ever will. But uh, one of this is the, the title what the Lord sharing with me as I study this is the ingredients of biblical conversion. And I wanted to make this short, but I'm not so sure it's going to be. So uh, just bear with me on this thing. Uh, and uh, again, we're going to go back to Romans chapter three. I'm going to read this, and we'll start uh, teasing it apart and uh, seeing what the Lord's trying to say to us. But uh, let's go, Lord, in prayer first. Father, thank you for this time together. Uh, thank you for what you share. Uh, how you, you're just amazing. I stand in awe, and all I can do is bow before you because uh, your wisdom, your knowledge, your your glory, your holiness is just amazing, and uh, you want us to know you, and, and that just is another aspect that just keeps amazing me because you just keep driving us deeper and deeper into your knowledge, into your truths, into into Jesus and what he's done, and and gosh, it just goes on and on, and, and all I can do is sit here in awe and bow before you in awe and in worship, because you are our everything. You, gosh, words can't express it. That, that's been the struggle of mankind since day one is just trying to put into our feeble vocabulary your glory. And uh, Father, thank you for this lesson. Thank you for what you shared with me. Pray that you help me share with them. And uh, I don't share it as somebody that's got it all put together because I'm still learning this myself. And uh, but but learning it is one thing and applying is another. So I just pray that for us all too. Uh, I pray for our pastor today as he stands and shares uh, just so many things over the last few Sunday school lessons that that you've just confirmed things that he's been preaching in my heart, and this one does too because it just ties right in with what he preached to us last Sunday. So I uh, just want to say we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to pick up Romans chapter 3, and we're going to start again in verse 21. My iPad's not cooperating this morning. Still not cooperating. That's what you get for doing these on an iPad. There we go. Romans 3.21. We'll start verse 21 and read down through uh, 27. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, verse 23, and for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in the blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. 
Verse 26. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Verse 27. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. Well, actually, we're going to get 28 too. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So again, we're going to, we're going to talk about the ingredients of, of conversion, the ingredients of salvation. And uh, we'll summarize this here at the end of, and where we're going with this. But the first one, and, and we see it right here in this passage, is the recognition of God to, to stand in his glory, to, to see him for who he is. And and this has to be revealed. This this is just not something that this, that, that everybody gets to see. And uh, when we see this, when he gives us the opportunity to see this, it, it, it just it changes everything. It, it gives us a different perspective. Again, that's picking up Romans uh 321 but now apart from the law the righteousness of god has been manifested it's it's revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets verse 22 even the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ for all those who believe for there is no distinction there's no distinction between god and jesus they're one and the same and paul continues how we have the opportunity to recognize god by what jesus did and why he did it and then verse 25, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit right here. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Verse 26, for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So there's just so much to unpack here. Uh, we've discussed some of this in previous Sunday school lessons, but our focus right here is again is going to be God's righteousness, His glory, the the attributes of God. And you know, I know we've talked about that some in the past, but that's the game changer right there. That's that's one of the things, one of the 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 uh, initial ingredient that begins this process in people's lives. So uh, you know, we, so many words have been used to describe God. You know, you, uh, omnipresent, omnipotent, holy, uh, his, his glory. And, and it, again, it's just mankind trying to, to come up with words in our vocabulary to try to, to describe who we see or how we see God in, in, in his fullness. But the reality of it is, is experiential. Uh, it's the experiential relationship. It, it's time with God. It's it's fellowship with God. It's you know knowing Him and knowing that He wants us to spend time with Him, and uh, that's that's really the key to to everything. It's not just the 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 descriptives because you know you can you, like I've shared with you before. You see neighbor across the street, you know it's your neighbor because you've seen them before. You've probably even talked to them a few times. Okay, so. When you see them, you recognize them. But there's so many things about them that we don't know because we don't really, you know, we maybe not spend as much time, probably not even as much time as we should. But uh, there's an intimate relationship. And I'm not talking about, you know, uh, like a husband and wife kind of intimate relationship. But when you really get to know somebody, you know, like their favorite color, you know, things that make them angry and happy and things like that. And that's the experiential relationship in that fellowship that's talking about here with God. So here Paul's calling his readers to experience God's righteousness. Uh, the true, this is the true recognition and probably better known as revelation. It, it's God revealing to us who he is, because other than that, we, we wouldn't have a clue. We wouldn't be able to even go there. So Paul goes on to say that the law and the prophets saw it. God has always revealed himself in different ways. You, you've got creation. The Bible tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. They don't suggest it. They declare it. And uh, through his word, through people that have experienced him in the past, but the ultimate revelation of who he is would come through Jesus because there is no distinction. Jesus is the full revelation of God because he is God. 
So with that recognition, the recognition of God, there's a second recognition that follows. And we've seen it in Isaiah chapter 6. We've mentioned that before. Uh, it picks up Romans chapter 3, and, and it's no mistake that Paul throws this in again right here. You know, we've shared in the past that this is just a confirmation of what he's shared in chapters 1 and 2 in the first, very first part of 3 down through uh, verse 10 or so. And uh, he's digging a hole, putting mankind in it. And he's just confirming that again here. But it's also a recognition of ourselves in light of the glory of God. And he says in verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory that we've just got revealed to us in his righteousness. Uh, this is a simple passage that can be taken lightly uh, apart from the ones that surround it. Again, just, just telling you at first glance what I saw in it. But digging deeper, what he's really calling us to see here is ourselves in light of God's glory. Again, this has to be experienced to have the proper effect. It's not just talking about it or reading about it or anything like that. It's, it's knowing God. Uh, again, it's exactly what Isaiah noticed, and it made him cry out, Woe is me. You know, that was his response after seeing the glory of God. This is absolute destitution that generates total dependency. What we begin to realize is that if God doesn't do something on our behalf, just like Isaiah saw it, it's over with. There is no hope. We're not going to stand there. We're not going to be able to stay there. Probably wouldn't want to stay there because that glory is just too much for, the, for us to be with, to be around. Uh, the next ingredient is repentance. Now, Paul doesn't speak about that much right here, but it's, it's a biblical, there's a biblical foundation to it. Uh, you can't get away from it. There's too many implications about it in Scripture, and it cannot be left out of conversion. It, it, there's no way. Repentance is seeing things through the eyes of God from his perspective. It's realizing we haven't been living by his standards. We clearly see the devastation sin has caused and will continue to cause in a fallen world because of God's changing of our desires. Uh, we want to stop participating in this, in this destruction. You can look back at, your, I can, I can look back at my own life and see things I've done. And again, God forgives us. He always, you know, if you cry out for forgiveness, he's faithful and just to do so. But the reality is it, 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 there's a snowball effect there. He, he doesn't take away the consequences. There's, there's, a, there's something that we started that there's still going to be issues with that we're, it's going to have to be dealt with because of things that have been done. Can't get away from that. Uh, Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of God. This is what he says, verse 15, and saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, and here it is, repent and believe the gospel. It's turning away from sin. You've heard that probably a hundred times. It's not wanting to do the things that we've loved to do in the past because when we can now clearly see through everything else that's happened that it's, it's just going to cause problems. Uh, we need redemption. That's the next, uh, that's the next ingredient. Uh, it's being justified. That's what redemption is. And it picks up Romans chapter 3, verse 24, being justified as a gift. This is a gift. Uh, there's nothing you can do to obtain it. It's, it's just given by God by his grace, the passage says, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And uh, here Paul shares with a person uh, that has recognized the righteousness of God, uh, has seen who they are in the light of the fact that uh, who he is, and has cried out to God, do something for me. You know, I, I'm going to melt right here in, in light of your glory. I need you to do something. And uh, he also tells right here how they can have it. Uh, to be in the presence of God, we must be justified. A justification is a gift given by grace. It's free. We, we would never deserve it. We can never work our way to it. Uh, we will never do enough to be able to earn it. Uh, it, and it's by what Jesus did on that cross. It's, it's you know, substitutionary atonement is, is a label we put on it. But again, it's just a, a Christian uh, cliche if we don't get in here and realize the, you know, the fullness of what Jesus has done for us. Uh, this and only this gives us the opportunity to stand, ask, or be able to receive anything from God. The next uh, ingredient is have faith. Or, you know, we can say believe, and we'll deal with both of those topics right here. <clears throat> Picks up in verse 22, Romans chapter 3. 
even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Uh, the NASB, uh, which is usually what I study from, uh, trans uh, translated, it's a little bit different, but uh, really I like the King, King James Version better. <clears throat> it says it like this, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. <clears throat> now you may not have noticed any difference there much uh, as we was reading it, but we'll get to that in a minute. Studying the translated words of faith and believe, we find how closely they are related. And this is just one of the things the Lord just blew me away studying for this. I, I thought, well, this is going to be pretty short and uh, probably put this together pretty quick. And I got really sitting down yesterday and digging into this thing. And and gosh, I just I couldn't get away from it. Uh, I understand we have the word of God in our language. I get that. But uh, we also got to understand it, it, it's much deeper than just our vocabulary. We talked about that already and, and even prayed that. Uh, some meanings get lost in translation. Uh, as much as the, the biblical uh, the writers that, that translated this from its original language into our own, that they struggled trying to, even going word for word, getting the fullness of this. And, it, and even in translation, it doesn't make Scripture errant. I don't even want to make it sound like that because it's not. So what it really is is it's a gold mine. The, the Word of God becomes a gold mine, and He gives us the tools. There's all kinds of stuff that helps us dig deeper. And through prayer, through His revelation, I mean, just pray continuously about what the Lord wants you to learn from this thing, and He'll, he'll open it up to you. And he's given us the tools. We, we have prayer. We have the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's there's ways, there's things that people have written in the past that he gives us access to. Uh, and, and really what we end up doing, just, just reading this on the surface, is we're, we're digging in a gold mine with a spoon. You know, you're going to get some gold because it's a gold mine. But, you know, he also gives us an opportunity to find bigger tools to dig with and how much more gold will we come out of this thing if we use those other tools. So faith right here is the Greek word pistis. Uh, pistis is a noun and is defined as, pay attention to this, uh, first one is relating to God, the conviction that God exists and, the, and, the, and is the creator and ruler of all things, the provider and bestower of eternal salvation through Christ, and number two, relating to Christ, a strong and welcome conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. And there's scriptures where we'll go through these. It's going to line up with this definition. So this actually is, it's a noun, but it becomes a possessive noun. So it's something that belongs to God that has to be revealed or given. And, and, and again, that's this revelation of his glory. Listen how that uh, definition that played out when Jesus asked the disciples, you know, that they've been out and they come back and he says, all right, who's everybody saying that I am? And they're saying, oh, well, you, you're John the Baptist, you know, come back and, and all these other things. And uh, one of the prophets, and he says, well, all right, flips the question. He's after he listens to him for a minute. He says, all right, who do you say that I am? And I, I just picture a, a moment of silence right there because you know, Jesus was really, he was kind of tough on these guys. He was telling them, you know, oh, ye of little faith. He, he was calling them on the carpet in a lot of ways. And uh, I, 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 and poor old Peter, he, he's bold and he's going to jump out there. But this is one of the great things he definitely says. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus proclaims that Peter's blessed because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to him. God had to reveal this to him. His he says, my father in heaven revealed this to you. You're blessed, Peter. And and you, you begin to see how faith in that definition takes effect in Peter's life. Uh, we see this. And again, I'm reading from the King James here because it to me, this is just a better translation of this. Galatians chapter two, verse 16, knowing that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have been even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The faith that's owned by Jesus can then be transferred to people. It's his to start with. It's his to give. 
and he, he wants to give it. He wants to give it to people. Again, King James Version here, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author, he started this, he gave it, and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the word hour in that passage right there is not used in the original text and even some other translation, but seeing faith as originally owned by Jesus and given to mankind uh, as a gift for us to have, uh, it gives clarity to the truest intent. We're partakers of Jesus. Jesus is the author of our faith. It's the faith of Jesus not faith in Jesus in that context. You know, there's, there's other passages in the King James. It doesn't stick to the faith of. It goes on and it says faith in. So you've got these two. Uh, they're not different faiths. It's faith initiated and given by Jesus that becomes our possession, and then we can be partakers of it. Uh, it's the faith of Jesus that gives us the opportunity to believe in Jesus, according to Paul in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. And if you go on in chapter uh, 2, verse 20, and the faith he gives, he works until it's perfected, according to the writer of Hebrews. Uh, this also gives clarity, and I'm going to read this from the ESV, because I, I think it uh, made it sound a little, a little better in relating to this, but you dig into it, it all means the same, whichever translation you dig from. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. It's God given. Jesus has given it. So in this context, Paul's writing to a body of believers. Not everybody is given this faith. And it's not just men, it's the whole body. It's, well, it's ladies too in this context right here. Uh, when you, Children, it doesn't matter. When you add Romans 1, 17 to the mix, we're not going to read that, but go back and check it out, you get the faith of Jesus that gives faith in Jesus that drives us to believe. You see the step process going on right there. So that takes us down to believe in, in this ingredient that we're talking about. Believe is translated from the Greek word, listen how similar this sounds, pisteo. Remember, faith is pistis. This is pisteo, and if I'm pronouncing it right, I may not be. But pisteo is a verb and is defined as, number one, used in the New Testament of the conviction and trust to which a man is impelled by a certain inner and higher prerogative and law of soul. And number two, to trust in Jesus or God is able to aid either in obtaining or in doing something, and that translates into saving faith. Uh, pistuo, believe, is basically a verbal form of pistis, faith. It's, it's the action that drives from the, verb, for, for, from the noun, I should say. So believing now becomes mankind's responsibility to the faith we possess. If that makes sense, I hope it does. I hope the Lord used me to, to clarify this, how he you know, explained it to me. So just like our pastor shared last week in, in Frank's message, our actions are reflections of what we believe. Uh, in the Bible teaching series, I don't know if you guys have ever heard it, of it or not. Donna did a, 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 a session on it. It's been several years back now, but it, if you get a chance to listen to it, it's awesome. Uh, it's the Truth Project. Dale Tackett uh, did this. And he presented this as a haunting question. He said it haunted him, and he didn't want to be haunted alone, so he's passing it on to this class he was teaching. Do you really believe what you believe is really real? Because if we believe what we say we believe, it's life-altering. It's life-changing. You can't get away from it. There, there's... You've been in that presence of God. You've, you've been through these steps up to this point. You've lived them. You've experienced them. And it, it changes the dynamics of everything that we see. And he goes on to say that if we did, this is Dale Tackett talking about the Truth Project, we could turn the world upside down. And not only would we find time to pray, if we realized what a privilege that it was to pray, we'd want to stay in the presence of God always. I think that's why the Bible, the Bible tells us to, uh, to, to pray continuously. 
and uh, we wouldn't want to get up. We wouldn't get, want to get away from that. It's the presence of God in our lives. So believing is taking possession of the faith Jesus offers as a gift and wanting our lifestyles to reflect how we cherish it, protect and to protect it and, and share that truth to, to give it to others. Uh, according to Hebrews 12, uh, verse 2, Jesus will continue to be the focal point of our cherishing, protecting, and sharing until we're perfected. And uh, this replaces mankind's fallen self-centeredness and brings it back to what we were created to be, and that's God-centered, giving glory back to Him and let Him be on the throne of our hearts. Uh, the next uh, ingredient here is worship, and it, it, it boils down to cause and effect. And it's because of these other things, this can't be held back. Uh, you can't remove this from, from the, the ingredients here, and we'll get in, into that here in a minute too. So uh, many times we think of worship as raising our hands, you know, lifting our hands in church and, and listening to a, a song that, that that's, it, you know, singing the praises of Jesus and exalting him. And that's great. Don't misunderstand. I'm, I'm, I'm not putting that down. That is worship. That is a form of worship. But true worship, uh, worship that is life altering and heart changing becomes a life lived in belief lived believing what we already know and wanting that to be a, a reflection to others so that they can see the same things we see or have the opportunity to the same things that, that God has given us to see. And that's his glory, uh, his righteousness, as Paul has already shared, uh, to see who Jesus really is. To Like I said, you keep, I keep saying the cross is uh, the introduction to the relationship that he calls us to have because it's it's basically God saying, this is who I am. This is what I love. This is what I hate. This is how bad I hate it. This is what I have to do about it because I'm, right, I'm a righteous judge and I'm holy. And this is the opportunity I give you to give into this relationship because I love you. And uh, now what are you going to do about it? And uh, again, it, 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 it's seeing his glory and it, it's wanting to, to, to be the reflection of that glory to other people. This is always the outcome of true salvation, a life altering change, always. And it's always in worship. It's taking what rightfully belongs to God and, and it's giving it back to him because taking these things and keeping it for ourselves, it's stealing from God and, and he will not tolerate it. And I just can't help but think about how many times, you know, we do that. When you, when you step out and you do something out of the way for somebody and they say, oh, well, thank you. Well, the door's wide open right there to, to say, you know what? You know, there was a time I probably wouldn't have done this for you. Or there was a time in my life that, uh, you know, I'd, whatever the case is, just the door's wide open to, to take that opportunity and say, and introduce them to Jesus saying, Jesus has changed my heart. That's the reason I'm doing these things. And I want to give all that glory back to him. Uh, in John chapter 10, Jesus calls people entering the sheepfold by some other way than the sheep gate. He calls them thieves and robbers. And in that context, Jesus declares himself as the gate. That's what he's saying right there. He's the only way in. The only way you're getting into the body or into glory or into heaven, however you want to say it, and, and it, like Frank keeps telling us, you know, we're in the presence of God now. We, we live in this life just like we're already with Jesus because we are. And it, it announces to everybody that thinks that they can get there without glorifying him for that way that he has provided on that cross. They're actually stealing God's glory. That's what Jesus is saying in this passage. And they're thieves and robbers. I'm convinced it's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 to those saying, Lord, Lord, to depart from him, they stole his glory. And uh, listen to their defense. We'll read this verse right here. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. I've shared this before, and it's just one of those things that, that it's just hammered in my head and in my heart. Uh, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Pretty much saying what they're what they're telling Jesus right here is, look what we did in your name. And this proves them so they, they proved in in their expression right here that they're they're trying that, that they stole God's glory because they're trying to get in by their own own merit. Look what we did. 
And, and, and you could put I right there and make it a little more personal and it wouldn't take it out of its context. Look what I did for you, Jesus. you got to let me in. And he's pretty much saying, you missed the point. And uh, these people, what, what they lost and what they lacked is worship. They never worshiped Jesus for what he was doing in and through them. And nothing that they really did amounted to any good because they were given no glory to God in, in this process. They were doing good things. But Jesus called the good things they did iniquity later on, if you read on down through that. Uh, they're standing in the presence of God clothed in their own righteousness, and they can't stay. They're not going to be able to stay there. Isaiah penned it down this way, uh, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8. I am the Lord. This is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. And this is why Paul would say in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, or yeah, verse 27, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. Verse 28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Where's boasting? Boasting is essentially, essentially exalting God for who he is and for what he's done. The law couldn't do it. The law didn't change people's hearts. The, you know, the Bible tells us that. Was it was it God's commands and God's perfection? Yes, but you know what? Uh, telling somebody not to do something without giving them the love in their heart to not do it is it, just like building a fence for a pig. You got, you got to fence them in to keep them inside where you want them contained because you, know, you take the fence down, they're going to wander. Uh, we, we stay where God has put us because we love him and we love people. And, and that's the love that he gave us. That's his love. That's his imputed love. Th that love didn't generate in us automatically. He has to put it there. And, and because of that, we will boast in him. We will glorify him. We will give that honor and praise back to him, back to Jesus for what he's done. And it's defi this definition is actually rejoicing, but in this context, it's a form of worship. When you dig that up and, and see what he's trying to say right there. Uh, Jeremiah, t Jeremiah tells us that God said, this is uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, Verse 24, but let him who boasts, boast of this. Oh, this is amazing. That he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. You want to delight in God? You want him to delight in you? Boast in him. Give him the glory that belongs back to him. And if you went through these processes right here, if you've gotten these ingredients in your life, you can't help it. You can't help it. Uh, so again, we're going to summarize real quick right here. Go back through the things we've talked about. Uh, to have true salvation, our lives must, must reflect all of these ingredients. And I try to think of some ways to give an examples of that. And, and really, I didn't come up with any really good ones. Because, you know, I, I don't cook much, very, very little. I just started looking up some things, some chemical reactions and things that try to make, if you left something out, how that would turn out. But but I, I, I think this is pretty well self-explanatory, and the Bible lays it out for us. You can't remove one. You can't take one of these out and, and still have biblical, true salvation. And uh, the first one, recognition of God. In light of that, recognition of ourselves, who we are in the light of God's glory, repentance. And again, repentance is not a one-time deal because we still live in flesh. We still live in the world. We still battle with Satan. And uh, we are going to stumble sometimes. Uh, I don't want to make an excuse for that. I don't want to use it for a crutch because I hate it. 
Well, I hate it when I do it, but the, the reality is it happens and uh, repentance is continual. Repentance should be daily and, uh, and, and maybe even just as the day goes on, things that the Lord's saying, wait a minute, that wasn't right because he does, he, he'll do that. So it's continual repentance, not just the one time praying at an altar and the rest of your life is good. Uh, redemption, understanding what he did for us so that we can fellowship with him and have the opportunity to be in his presence. Uh, it's faith given. We talked about that. It's, it's the faith of Christ that gives us faith in Christ. That's faith received. And, and that drives us to believe. And that's our lives reflecting the gift that we have been given. It's a lifestyle lived for the glory of God and, and uh, for Jesus. And, and that ends up in worship. It, it's to remove any one of these elements uh, from the process. What you really have, honestly, is a lost person. That's who they are, and and you cannot take one of them out. And uh, I just hope we've hammered that point. And uh, again, I hope the Lord has used this somehow to uh, glorify Himself and to uh, to encourage you. This is not meant to to cause you to doubt your salvation. This is meant to to give you the opportunity to uh, maybe if, if something is missing right here to go back. If you're alive, there's still hope. So uh, go back and look these things over. Dig them out yourself. Uh, uh, pray. Uh, you know, this is the, the Lord's the one that gives conviction. The Lord's the one that changes our hearts. You know, and I think a lot of a lot of times we try to 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 pronounce people saved, and it's really not our job. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's job. He's the one that that confirms and seals. He's the one that that puts that stamp of approval that what God has done uh, it, it has changed people. So uh, pray. Dig into this. Get into God's word. Uh, again, faith come by, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So uh, uh, just want to say we love you and uh, thank you for listening.